Hello and welcome to Forward 2021, our annual conference. Um, this is the third year in a row that we're bringing together logistics pros, technologists and trade veterans to discuss global trade. My name is Sonam Anders, I'm Flexport COO, and I'm here together today with Phil Levy, who is Flexport's chief economist. Um, today, we're going to talk about how uh, we're using uh, data from the Flexport platform uh, to, real uh, to reveal trends in uh, global trade. Um, and that's dangerous, as you know, because, oh boy, we were all so wrong in March 2020 about the future. We all predicted doom and gloom, and look where we are today. Um, so, Phil, um, the big question for you is, how long will these crazy times last? Yeah, that is the big question, and it's, it's what everybody's trying to ask. And, of course, it's not just idle curiosity. It's, you know, all of our, our listeners out there having to make business decisions, make investments, and those investments depend on what comes next. Um, what we're gonna do in this session is we're gonna talk about how we can get you the best answers in a very, very uncertain time. Before we do that, um, a few niceties here. Please do keep in mind that all of the information provided in this event is based on the situation at the time and may not be customized to your specific situation. All right, Sana, you wanted me to talk about how to tell the future. You know, what, what do we know about what's coming up next? And what I would suggest is when you boil it all down, you've got a few different big avenues for, for finding your way to the future. One of those is you can look at past trends and say, let's assume those trends continue. Where does that take us? A second thing one can do is you can scan the horizon and see if there's certain things coming up, you know, where the, these are big events that might take you off those, those predicted paths. And then we're also going to talk about a third thing you can do, which is maybe, and in our case is true, you have some, we have data which can give us some insight about what's going to happen, that we can use Flexport platform data to take a peek at what's coming next and maybe give people an informational edge. So let's talk a little bit about how we can foresee the future. The easiest way is if things are happening in a predictable fashion, we just project them on. So here you see a very simple curve going on into the future. If it extends, that's easy. In a business like logistics, you see a lot of cyclical patterns, that there'll be quarters that are busier than others. Sometimes those patterns are overlaid on top of those broader trends, and you get it together in a sort of more sophisticated trend, but it's really the same idea. Past patterns hold, take us on to the future. This hasn't really been the world that we've been in. Um, we, we've had all kinds of things that have taken us off those paths. Sana, what, what have we seen? Yeah, and, and, and let's go to the next slide because, um, you know, um, I, I liked it. I, I was reading the, the Economist the other day and, 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 and the, 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 the week was called the shortage economy. And that's actually a gr pr pretty good description on where we are um, um, as an economy. And uh, it's, it's worthwhile to spend a minute on how did we actually get here, right? Um, as, as referred to in my, in my intro, when the pandemic hit, we all predicted doom and gloom, right? There was no precedent for this. Uh, maybe the Spanish flu, but that was too long ago. We didn't memorize it anymore. And it might also not be applicable today to today's globalized world. Um, so what happened um, is that immediately companies started furloughing people, uh, let go large amounts of, of skilled employees, dramatically reduced uh, purchase order. We saw that in the data from our platform, mothballed pro uh, production capacity and postponed investment, right? As a result, you know, of all these investment cuts, supply went down, right? There was less supply um, to, to build the products for, 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 for the consumers, but we all assumed that the consumers would not buy any goods. But shortly after something happened, right? We spent, spent, started, uh, uh, started spending money in a different way. Right? Rather than on holidays and in restaurants, uh, we actually spar started spending money um, on you know, work from home equipment, uh, new bicycles, uh, a new dog, and the dog toys, um, furniture, and, 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 and more of these things. And a lot of companies were not prepared for this, uh, for this demand boom, and this has led to, uh, to the shortages that we see. My favorite example is actually car dealer loss, right? You, you stare the world's problems uh, directly. Um, uh, you, you face the, 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 the world's problems immediately when you stare at a dealer lot. They're empty, right? Uh, and it's uh, supply chain constraints. Uh, it's the chip manufacturing, but it's also all kinds of parts uh, that, you know, they can't manufacture any cars right now. Um, and um, I was personally, I was at, 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 at my dealer the other day uh, for, for a service appointment. And, and I asked him, you know, <laughs> 
how long is it going to take for me if I want to order that specific car that he didn't have on the lot, by the way? He said, probably 18 months. And he looked pretty depressed about it because how is he going to make money if he can't sell any cars? Um, but as a logistics industry, we were also not ready for this, right? Logistics is a heavy uh, asset industry. And in a steady state, that means that you have to re uh, run 90 to 95% utilization to make a decent return above, uh, above the cost of capital. Well, if you look at the demand boom, the demand boom brought us much uh, above the 100%, uh, which means that all of a sudden we're in a shortage position to basically provide the supply uh, to let the economy run. Um, so now the question is like, is this long-term or is this transitory? Um, and I think for that, we have to dive a little bit deeper uh, into uh, what demand really looks like. Well, if you look at the next slide here, um, you see actually um, what personal expenditure has looked like over the last five years. And you see a clear pattern break just after COVID, uh, after the, the initial COVID um, in the summer of 2020. We stopped spending money on services, which is the green line. Um, we got back to the normal behavior on non durable goods, but we started spending double digit more on durable goods. Phil, what do you read in, in, in this uh, as an economist? I think this is a fascinating graph. I think when you look at you know, economic variables, it's rare that you see something as constant as you saw in personal consumption expenditures. The way we're showing it here, you have this very, very stable relationship of how much of people's income was spent on each of these categories. And that's what that sort of line that moves kind of tightly together. This is all scaled um, to, I think, February 2020 equals 100. But it's that line that moves tightly together. And then all of a sudden, what had been this, this constant about behavior goes all over the place. So this, this actually is shocking in a couple of directions. So first, there's that pattern break that we're not keeping these ratios the way they were. We're spending a lot more on goods. You were right about the breakdown between durables and non-durables, but it was really, we are, and most advanced economies are, heavily a service economy. And so this was a big jump in goods. That was a switch. The other thing, which is really striking if you look at this, and if you say, well, the, the premise of this is that we had this very sharp economic shock, is normally we think big economic shock, that means that incomes are going to go down and consumption is going to go down. And you saw that initially there was kind of a head fake in that direction, right? Everything does go down for that first month or so. But that was a, a, the big surprise. And I think this has been a huge part of the strain on the system was very quickly, by the time we got to the summer of 2020, we were not seeing decreased goods consumption. We were seeing increased. And that, I think, was a lot of what caught people off guard and was, was, was countered expectations and, and past experience. So, so, so the next question is, of course, uh, when we flip to the next slide, is um, how long will it take for supply to catch up with demand, right? Um, and, and, and for today's discussion, we'll focus on ocean capacity as 95% of, of all goods travel internationally by boat, right? So what do you see on this slide here? Um, you know, in the, in the green line, you see demand for space, which is essentially um, uh, driven by the double-digit growth in durable goods. Um, in purple, you see the plant space, which is actually the world's assets that are deployed to, uh, to meet this demand, right? Um, as you all know, it takes a long time to manufacture ships or planes. Uh, and in a steady state world, um, there are always idling vessels, but not anymore. What you actually see is after January 2020, um, or actually a little bit later, in the summer of 2020, you see the plant space creeping up. That means that more vessels that were idling were deployed uh, to meet the demand. But what you actually see in the red line is the actual space. And that is the planned space corrected for the delays that we're actually seeing right now. And what you're seeing is, although the demand is high, we, there's more uh, capacity made available, um, the actual space didn't grow. Um, and this is just a result of all the uh, bottlenecks that we're seeing. And this is, of course, ports. This is trucking capacity, warehousing capacity. They all create their delays in a system. And as a result, um, the actual space is much smaller uh, than the uh, real uh, the plant space. This is actually a large problem. You know, a sea intelligence study um, uh, shows that 13% of the world's capacity is currently tied up in vessel queues. And for the Trans-Pacific, it's even worse. It's around 20%. Um, for reference, that is more than the third largest ocean carrier in terms of capacity. 
The irony here is that um, if you keep on adding vessels right now, you're just making the vessel queues longer, right? Uh, the bottleneck has moved from the ocean, has moved to the land side, which means uh, ports, automation, infrastructure uh, that are needed to service, uh, to service these, uh, these vessels. Uh, therefore, um, I think, um, and we think, it's a good thing that the Biden administration is addressing this with longer opening hours of the ports. But keep in mind, uh, it's not the silver bullet. Much more needs to happen uh, to make this system work. So, Sana, this is kind of the answer to this question I think a lot of people are asking, you know, has there been a supply response? We've seen prices go up. And I think your answer to be, yes, there has, but it's very hard to translate that into effective capacity. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and that has to do with the length of the asset cycles. Um, you know, in, essentially, if you're looking at ships, it, it's pretty easy to deploy them. Right or to you know take them out of an idling situation. Right, um, um, in terms of port infrastructure, it's much harder. Right, uh, it's not that you can build a port uh, overnight. Uh, the only thing that you, uh, the only lever that you have right now is to um, improve the efficiency of the port, and that means longer opening hours or working harder or smarter uh, through automation. Uh, those are the things that you can do, uh, but it's very hard to overnight uh, add infrastructure there. So let's go to the next slide and see how this is developing um, over time. If you're looking at this slide and again, focusing in on the um, uh, ocean capacity, here you see uh, the projected capacity growth uh, over the next uh, couple of years. What we do know is that ocean carriers have responded, right? Um, they have responded by uh, putting in a lot of vessel orders. And the, the current new ship uh, capacity um, is roughly 2.8 or 2.9 million TEU, uh, which is uh, roughly 11 or 12% of total uh, today's overall uh, container fleet capacity. This is, um, uh, this is all very encouraging, uh, but as I said before, it takes a long time to build vessels. Um, so what we will see is that most of these vessels will start coming into the market from 2023 onwards. So that's where you see actually a demand or a supply growth in, in this graph. Um, so what's the takeaway of this? Um, 2023 is a pretty conservative estimate for us to uh, see the ocean market stabilize. Um, when the demand remains high, the supply is not increasing because of the lead times. We have to just anticipate uh, that this situation will last till the supply um, is, 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 is actually being uh, addressed. By the way, this is very similar in the air freight, and I'll spend a few, uh, a few seconds on that as well. Um, with the big difference is that the supply constraint there is driven by the grounded white body passenger planes. Um, getting back to normal um, there is much more defined by us traveling again. Um, and that may quite, uh, take uh, quite a while, right? Um, uh, consultancies like BCG um, expect that business travel will never fully recover and will remain 20 to 25 uh, percent below its 2019 peak. And that will have a lot of impact on the um, uh, on the network of airlines. Um, it is ex actually expected um, that on uh, a lot of routes like Amsterdam to New York, the six, seven hour, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, six, seven hour type of routes, they will downsize from dual uh, aisle planes to single aisle planes, uh, which will mean that there is way less cargo capacity because a 737 doesn't carry the same as a Dreamliner. Um, this is very early to call because we don't know how we will be traveling um, in, 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 in a year or two from now. It also is very much depending on which borders will be opening. So I highly rec recommend you to stay connected with Flexboard webinar series where we monthly update our views uh, um, uh, on the market here. There are a lot of uncertainties on the horizon. Um, let me first start with the port functioning and contract negotiation. Currently, the ports are a standstill. Uh, we all know the reports about the number of vessels at birth and outside uh, Long Beach and LA. Um, that means we have to increase the throughput of containers in the ports. And there are a lot of factors get, uh, that go into it. It's not only the size of the ports and the, and, 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 and the terminals and the yards, it is also how can we make uh, terminals more efficient, but also is the ecosystem around the port uh, able to, uh, to deal with it? For instance, do we have enough truckers or our warehouses open uh, at the right time? Therefore, it's very interesting to watch the ILWU, the uh, Labor Union's contract negotiation that is up for July 2022. Because a 
beyond the negotiations about pay, which are very normal, next year, uh, the negotiation will also be about automation, whether it's going to slow down or even roll back. Um, and we expect, of course, this will not go easy because with the current situation, um, the um, the, the, the opinions of the stakeholders there around automation have further polarized, um, where you know the owners of the ports want more automation to increase the throughput, um, where of course the labor unions want to preserve as much as possible um, of the labor. Um, we don't expect that the um, um, uh, contract negotiation will be reached smoothly, um, and this what might lead to a serious disruption. Um, in uh, 2022 and probably for, you know, um, into peak season of, of, of 2022. Uh, um, you as a customer need to know what to do there. Um, and you need to think through what 2022 is going to look like. You know, are you going to move cargo through Mexico, the Gulf or the East Coast? Um, you know, this will lead to additional cost, uh, will lead to additional transit time. It will also lead to longer journeys of ships which effectively means against that uh, capacity will be reduced, uh, which might then lead to higher prices again. Let's go to this second uncertainty, which is about IMO 2023. Um, IMO stands for International Maritime Organization, and we all know it from the low sul sulfur diesel uh, uh, that was implemented in 2020. Um, in 2023, IMO is making the next step to further decarbonize this industry. Um, they want to, uh, they achieve, they aim to achieve 12% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. And the way to do this is that ships would reduce their speed. A reduction of speed also means a reduction of capacity. What we think right now is that it will lead to roughly 6% reduction in speed. Uh, but there's still a lot of uncertainty around that. So we have to uh, uh, monitor that closely. But 6% reduction in speed in 2023 would also mean that all the new capacity, capacity that is coming to the market around that time will be reduced by 6%. Okay, and I've got some uncertainties to add on top of your uncertainty, Sana. Um, one of the things we've seen um, when we talk about sort of pattern breaks and unusual things, this has been an extraordinary time for fiscal and monetary policy. One of the key driving factors in the goods demand was that Unlike in a standard recession, we had fiscal policy, the CARES Act, that put a lot of money in people's pockets. And that was part of what fueled this, this buying binge. Not only did it fuel the buying binge at the time, but there's a lot of evidence that, that, that some of that money ended up being saved, which means that it may fuel consumption into the future. But we are seeing serious changes in terms of what's happening with fiscal policy as Congress deliberates over what it wants to do next. And on top of that, we've been in a time of extraordinary monetary policy with very, very low interest rates. And on top of that, unusual bond buying. There's all kinds of signals that that's about to have a sharp change where the Fed has said it's going to be tapering those extra bond purchases. And before too long, possibly the middle of next year, possibly in 2023, it's going to start raising interest rates. That will have some profound effects on the economic environment and on consumer behavior. Also worth watching are some of the, the variabilities we've seen in the global energy situation. We've seen some serious spikes in energy prices, such as natural gas. Um, we've seen shortages of energy that have been affecting production in places like China. Um, this is, as the economy recovers, there's a demand for resources. This gets impacted by questions like, how cold is the winter, which tends to have a big effect on natural gas prices. But it in turn is having these, these energy shocks are having a direct effect on the cost of production. So that's also something you want to watch. All right. So where does this leave us all? <laughs> this leaves us with things kind of going haywire. Here, here you have a picture of, uh, of, of, uh, of ships lined up waiting to get into LA Long Beach in a way that we don't normally see. So we, we've had the, the kinds of things that San and I have been discussing. We had services consumption falling, durable goods rising. Um, how do we figure out what comes next? Here we're gonna get to this additional tool that we offer, which is thinking about uh, Flexboard data, what, where we go next and, and what Flexboard data can tell us. So let me start with something that we've developed uh, called the, the post-COVID indicator. And I'll confess, the name may be a little bit optimistic. 
Um, I, I hope we are truly post COVID soon, but it, it's trying to pick up on that graph that we saw earlier where we saw durables and non-durable consumption shoot up while services consumption went down relative to trend. This kind of rescales all of that and it's focused really on what is the share of personal consumption expenditures that's spent on goods. And it's scaled so that if we got back to zero, that would be that long-term trend that we saw in the graph. 100 is scaled to be the level at which we pretty much maintained in the summer of 2020. All right, so this is our measure of how crazy are these times? How different are consumer preferences? What you see on this is you see two lines. The green line is the actual data, which is, and it runs um, through the summer, uh, but it is saying, you know what? It has been crazy and it hasn't let up. That we, we had a peak, which was in the spring, where there was a real tilt towards buying goods over services. But as we've come back from that, we've come back to something where we're still at 20% more preference than we had in the summer of 2020. You'll notice that the red line goes further than the green line. What is that telling us? That is our prediction of the future. The, the red line is our model relating Flexport platform data to this crucial economic indicator. And what it turns out is that as not a total surprise, shipment data has some relation to ultimate consumption data some months later. This lets us actually peer ahead into the future and say something about what we expect to see in September, October, and November. And what we see is there's no sign of things going back to normal um, over that time period. It's, it's an open question what happens in the long run. You can tell the story both ways. You could say, well, when the health situation resolves, people's behavior will revert to what it was before. Or you could say people are creatures of habit and they'll keep doing what they've now learned to do. That's something we're gonna keep monitoring with this post COVID indicator. That's the premise of it all. But for the time being, we're well into the consumption boom and it doesn't show signs of letting up. All right, but that's not all that we're doing with, with Flexport platform data. We are also trying to help with business decisions. We have a, a growing suite of products that we call the um, Southeast Asian Sectoral Cost Indices, where we're able to use cost features to help inform decisions to reorient supply chains. We do this for several sectors. We do this for electronics and furniture and apparel. And in this case, we're looking at apparel in Southeast Asia. And what you see are some of the recent trends that are going on for cost in the sector. We're updating this quarterly. And the most recent uh, trend is showing that in this sector, we're actually seeing costs falling in Vietnam and rising in China. But we invite you to check this out. This is something that, that as people react to these, this turbulent time, we give more information about um, what, can, what can feed into business decisions. Finally, let me introduce something new. And this is Flexport making predictions about what's going to happen with US merchandise imports. So for those who are familiar with this data, this is slow data. It comes out, the government will put it out, but the government, you know, here we are in October, and so far the government has told us what happened in August. It, it has not said what's happened in September to imports. So if you are a financial type, or you just like to know this key element of, of the broader economic picture, we're using Flexport data to make our prediction. So here we do, the big red dot, we're saying when the September number comes out in a couple of weeks from the government, that's what we think it's going to look at. Now, I realize if you're not a financial type, predicting September when you're already in October may not seem like the most impressive feat in the world. So we're not going to stop there. Um, what we also do is we say, all right, with that one step ahead ability to forecast, we're going to do the kind of stuff that I was showing early on, where you project trends and you say, if things continue roughly on course, this is the trajectory that we see for merchandise imports for the year ahead. Um, now, no, this does not factor in big unexpected breaks, large interest rate hikes. It's the kind of sophisticated, both seasonal and broader trend analysis mixed with the advantage of getting that one step ahead that we get from Flexport platform data. 
So there's a longer run picture as one's trying to see what's happening with this pressure that we're seeing uh, on ports. And that's not all. The other thing we're able to do is because of the details we have, this is the, the top line here is the same as what you saw in the previous graph, but we're able to provide sectoral detail. And so as you look at the major subcomponents of merchandise imports, these are the trends that we're seeing for those subcategories um, over the next 12 months. Now, for all of these things, you know, there are error bands and, and the farther you go out, the bigger the error bands are. However, it's a level of detail that you can't find anywhere else. And there is a huge advantage to having the insight one month ahead of what's been publicly released. So that's what we have with a, a number of sort of insights that we can get from Flexport data. All right, Sana, you know, we, we've got a strange situation here. We've got um, no established playbook. This is not something we've really done before. We're, we're seeing these unconventional things where people have cut back on their services consumption, boosted their goods consumption. We're getting lots of this from the US um, where capacity is being pulled away from other trade lanes. Um, we don't know when there's gonna be a shift in preferences. We've got 350 million consumers each sort of solving this for themselves in unpredictable ways. Um, what does one do with all this? Yeah, well, yeah, this is this is the big question, right? This is the the, the million dollar question. Um, and um, you know, if we're looking now at our platform data based on what your uh, uh, your team is predicting, um, it looks like we will have a sustained import boom for at least another nine months, right? Um, um, so, you know, what does it actually mean then for the twenty twenty three capacity outlook? Well, we do know. Um, that in the next nine months, there will not be a lot of new vessels uh, nor planes entering uh, uh, service. What we also do know um, is that there are uh, potential disruptions coming from the um, uh, uh, ILWU uh, contract negotiations on, 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 on the West Coast. So our best prediction here is that, um, you know, the ocean market won't return to pre-pandemic levels uh, till the spring of 2023. Right. And pre pandemic, I don't mean then in terms of, let's say, uh, price levels. What I mean here is like, you know, um, at least in terms of service level, right? Um, high on time performance. Currently, we are at, uh, you know, low, uh, low 30s um, in terms of port to port on time performance. And that should go back to the, to the pre pandemic levels uh, when the uh, delays in the supply chain um, 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 are, 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 um, uh, resolving. But I think what we need to realize here is, you know, we keep on putting pressure on the system for at least another nine months. You know, even if you take the pressure away, then after nine months, it will take time to resolve this, right? It's the same as a traffic jam, right? The first car starts driving. It uh, doesn't mean that the last car starts driving immediately as well. So bottlenecks um, will remain in place. Right, uh, port operations. Uh, watch closely what the contract negotiations will bring. Watch closely uh, on the uh, driver shortage, right? Um, because it's a systemic issue. It's not only um, uh, the, the throughput of the port. It's also do we have enough drivers to pick up the containers? And look also at you know the things that the administration are doing. You know the coordination with the large retailers to commit on night operation was very encouraging. You know keeping the warehouses open, making sure that the drivers are available at night, and then opening the ports at night. That is resolving a system. Uh, if you're only opening the ports at night, that's not necessarily resolving a system. So that was super encouraging, and those are the things that we have to look out for. Let's go to the next slide. Um, the crystal ball. Yeah, you know, one of the things that strikes me as we talk about all this stuff, and as we deal with sort of clients, and you look at what's happening with um, the service providers, is how challenging this is. That they have to make business decisions whether to re rework a supply chain. You were discussing earlier whether to order additional ships, and so many of those things depend on making projections about what happens in the future. So. How should one go about that? We don't have the crystal ball, right? But we do have a lot of leading indicators uh, that can, uh, you know, form a better, uh, you know, um, a, a, a better informed opinion there. Um, so, you know, there are actually two, two, two outcomes here, right? It's the, the transitory market and the sustained market. Um, you know, let's talk about the transitory 
transitory market first. Uh, if demand reverts to normal um, um, and the consumer uh, only shows a temporary pattern break uh, for buying a lot of durable goods, um, it will take another 18 months uh, to basically clear out the backlogs and, and, and reestablish uh, equilibrium. So, you know, 2023, early 2023 for ocean, uh, somewhat later for air, um, depending on the international travel, then we should, should see, you know, are we going back to normal? But this is just one scenario. The other scenario is like, you know, we keep on spending and, our, you know, our leading indicators in, uh, say that we keep on spending um, and the consumer shows a clear pattern break in its behavior, then it will take a long time for supply to catch up. Um, because not only it does take a long time to, you know, build ships and increase the capacity of the ports, asset owners will also be reluctant to invest because, you know, what if it's a transitory market? You know, they don't want, they want to avoid a, a classic asset cycle um, where they can't make any money. Um, so in that scenario, we will have sustained um, uh, a sustained market uh, for a longer period of time. You know, I'm not going to say indefinite because I do believe in the capitalist forces uh, and that they will eventually catch up and, and take out the yield uh, above the cost of capital. Uh, but it's definitely going to uh, be longer than 2023. And you're probably looking at 2025 um, or, or so. So, you know, the big takeaway is here, it's like it's impossible to, 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 to predict the future uh, because we don't have a crystal ball, uh, but you can create competitive advantage uh, by being more agile. And what does that mean, right? Track all the leading indicators, both on the demand and the supply, right? I think we as a company um, try to, um, um, to, to give you as much information as possible through our monthly webinars whether it's our ocean webinar, our air webinar, the state of trade webinars with you, Phil, uh, and our newsletters, um, there's a wealth of, uh, of, of information, which is always real time. I think the other thing is uh, real time visibility on your own inventory, right? From order to delivery. Uh, so you can just act faster when disruptions are happening. Um, you know, this is, there's a lot of inescapable uncertainty here. Um, and, 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 but you're forced to make it, make bets as a business. Um, so the big takeaway is I, uh, you know, be better informed than others. Um, and, 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 and you will likely, uh, uh, build competitive advantage. All right. Well, Phil, this was a pleasure. Um, um, a great reveal today. Um, thank you all for, for joining today. Before you go, you shouldn't, uh, because we have two more very interesting, um, uh, presentations coming up. Uh, one is about a carbon neutral supply chain made easy uh, by Kathleen and G1. This is super interesting. And directly after that is the exporter workflow. So how do exporters um, um, uh, digitize their workflow uh, and, and, and therefore streamline their processes um, with our senior product manager, Kelly. Thank you so much. And um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the forward. Uh, and I hope to see you all next year in person. Thanks, everyone.